Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So I think this may well be my Christmas Eve video. We'll have to see if I manage to organise it as such. But um, I was racking my brains trying to think what I could do this year for my actual Christmas video. And um, I thought, let's do another artist retrospective. Now I hit upon doing um, the Moody Blues. And one of the reasons for that is that I've been getting reacquainted with their catalogue this year. But also I do think that the Moody's, they are a bit of a kind of winter's night type band or a Christmas morning type band. The sort of music which is very immersive, you know, you want to draw the curtains, wrap yourself in a duvet, light a candle and get stuck in. So um, I thought the Moody's would be a good one to do. I'll show you the collection, don't have everything. Quickly go through what I've got and, and talk a little bit about their music. So of course they were formed in Birmingham in the mid 1960s and they were called the M&B5 originally because they got some sponsorship from the Birmingham based brewery Mitchell and Butler and at the time the band was fronted by Denny Lane later to be in Wings of course. This is not their original first album The Magnificent Moody's which came out in 65. This is some kind of reissue I think. Um, rather interesting cover there with the androids uh, hands on the keys. Not quite sure how that fits into the Moody's mythology but um, they were a blues band originally and um, the band would have been Denny Lane on vocals and guitar and keyboards, um, John Lodge on bass and vocals, Mike Pinder on keyboards and um, Graham Edge on drums. The bluesy incarnation of the band didn't last all that long and um, it wasn't all that long before they had a, a sudden change of direction. Denny Lane left the band after the original big hit single Go Now which was at Christmas number one I think in would have been 65. The first album came out on the 23rd of July 65, didn't chart even though there'd been this big hit single and the band kind of started to fall apart a little bit. They recruited Justin Haywood, um, who was a very fine singer-songwriter and guitarist and famously they hit the um, chicken in the basket circuit in England and had a very miserable time for a couple of years. Then they, um, they got their act together by chance really. They they ended up making this record, of course. This is Days of Future Past, and um, really they were invited to test out the sound equipment, this um, Duramic sound system. And uh, they ended up, um, well, they were asked if they could do uh, a symphonic orchestral pop version of Vorjak's New World Symphony, which they weren't that keen on doing. But they used the sessions to piece together this record, which of course has the immortal hit Night in White Satin, which totally totally changed the band's fortunes and was a huge hit single and um, although this record itself surprisingly wasn't number one it got to number 27 uh, quite low down really released on the 10th of November 1967 Days of Future Past I have that version of it and I also have this um, reissue as well and I guess this is one of the very first ever pop psych um, orchestral Baroque pop, psychedelic masterpieces. You know, it came out the same year as Sgt. Pepper and uh, really did set the template for a lot of what was going to come afterwards in terms of not necessarily what you might think of as hard prog, but certainly orchestral music, orchestral pop music with a bit of a psych edge to it. It tells the story of just one day in the life of this guy and it goes through all these different moods and movements. But that was the record that launched them. And they then, well, what happened was they'd, they'd done this orchestral album, but they didn't really want to go down the route of having to cart an orchestra around with them. So they got Mike Pinder to do all the orchestral parts on keyboards. I think he'd come into possession of one of the first Mellotrons. I think he worked for a, a shop that sold them, and he ended up purloining one and uh, learning how to use it. So from this point onwards, the Moody's started to use the Mellotron in that very distinctive way they had. It was very um, it was very atmospheric, it was quite dark and psychedelic and wintry. Mike Pinder, where is he now, who he is, certainly um, came into his own on this record, a search um, in search of a lost chord, which came out in 1968, 26th of July 68, got to number five in the charts. So they jumped up from 27 to 5, they were clearly going places. This record is very psychedelic, as the cover would suggest. It has some quite, um, some quite far out stuff on it. Um, it's got Ride My Seesaw by John Lodge, which is a bit of a poppy song. Dr Livingston, I presume, by, by um, Ray Thomas. What's interesting about the Moody's is that they did all write songs. Um, there's not that many bands in rock history where everybody wrote um, and sang, I think, even. Actually, no, Graham Edge didn't sing the drummer. I think he, he used to, well, he used to write poetry on the records. Most of them were narrated by Mike Pinder, but um, Graham Edge did uh, narrate a few of them. These slightly pretentious 
poetic um, interludes which weave in and out of the music in, um, in quite a unique way really. Um, but all the band wrote, all the band sang. And I guess at first in the early days it would have been Justin Haywood who was the he was the best songwriter I think. For years when I started to get into the Moody's, this would have been back in the 90s, I used to get a bit frustrated listening to their records because I always used to think, there's the inner of this one, I always used to think that um, Justin Haywood was by far the best singer, by far the best songwriter in the band and it seemed like every time a Justin Haywood song came on um, it would lift the album a little bit and I used to get a bit impatient with the other songwriters and the other singers in the group but as time has moved on I've, I've learned to appreciate what the other guys brought to the band. John Lodge was a bit of a rookie at first, he was a bit of a novice and he used to jump around quite a bit, he used to write pop things, things were a bit more uh, a bit more garagey but then he also started to spread his wings and write things that were a bit more orchestral and a bit more grand and grandiose. Ray Thomas, uh, who played the flute, his songs are always very quirky and very English sounding, quite folky and then um, Mike Pinder stuff is usually the most psychedelic, I think Reading between the lines, listening to his lyrics on most of the songs he wrote for the Moody's, he seemed to be quite into that uh, transcendental meditation thing, into other realities, and he certainly seemed to be on a spiritual journey of some kind. So Mike Pinder, appropriately, because he had all the all the mellotrons and all the keyboards, so he had all these kind of swirly sounds at his commands. He held down the psychedelic corner of the band. So between them, you had you had a quite a good range of songwriting styles and vocal styles as well which in time I came to appreciate that the fact that it wasn't all just just in Haywood. The next album then was released on the 25th of April 1969 on the threshold of a dream and um, all these records I bought second hand over the years the Moody's have been a bit of a nightmare to collect in the sense that their records often look immaculate and you buy them and they look absolutely fine and then you stick them on the turntable and play them and they sound dreadful um, and I'm not quite sure why that should be it's just one of those things so I've had to upgrade over the years I've had to ditch various copies and try and buy replacements my collection is now I think is okay I think I've got decent copies of most of them uh, so um, here's this one. Always just lovely, lovely packaging. You know, they always have such attention to detail, and um, I love the autumnal nature of that shot. It's just, um, it's very, you know, of a time really, of a period. I love the way that um, I think it's Mike Pinder always has this kind of big handlebar moustache, and um, you know, he looks like somebody who should be smoking a pipe. He's very late 1960s. Um, but this is a very fine album too, uh, let's see what's on this one. Um, you've got Never Comes the Day, which is a beautiful Justin Hayward song. Um, Lazy Day by Ray Thomas, which has got a bit of a kinks, um, quirky vibe to it. Are You Sitting Comfortably? Um, what's the Mike Pinder song on this record? So Deep Within You on here, which again is one of his kind of inner journey type songs. Really good. <laughs> Lots of swirling fake strings on here and uh, psychedelic stuff going on. Very nice. I mean, songwriting wise, I sometimes think with the Moody's that um, their songs don't always, always have maybe enough substance to them given the amount of orchestration and given the amount of arrangement that went into them. I sometimes think that the material or the arrangement and the production sometimes outstrips the material a little bit. I don't always think that the albums, in terms of the songwriting, are kind of absolute top drawer. There's a, a kind of mixture with most of them, sort of, you know, peaks and troughs. But they're still good. They still hang together as albums, even though perhaps not all the individual parts um, are necessarily great. OK, so now we have um, 1969 released on the 21st of November, 69. Got to number two in the charts. So the previous album, On the Threshold of a Dream, sorry, was their first number one album. This one got to number two, Our Children's Children's Children. And this is another very fine album. Um, I love the cave drawing illustration on the front of this one and the picture on the inside of them gathered round a fire. This has got a good Mike Pinder tune on it as well. At the end of side one, um, you've got... Out and In by, um, actually it's a co-write, Mike Pinder and John Lodge, great song. Um, but also you have, what else do you have on here? You've got some great stuff. Sun is Still Shining by Mike Pinder is again quite floaty. Interesting, a couple of um, very, very short tracks by, by um, 
just in Haywood. I never thought I'd live to be a hundred. And then later on he reprises it with, I never thought I'd live to be a million. Good album, very strong. And um, still steeped in Mellotron and uh, late 60s atmospherics. So, um, okay, so then they come to the end of the 60s, moving to 1970. And on the 7th of August, 1970, um, they bring out this album, A Question of Balance. Now, by this time, they were they were huge. I think particularly in America, they were almost viewed as being seers or prophets. And, um, I mean, you know, they were, they were very much just normal working class guys from Birmingham. And I think they found it quite, um, quite overwhelming because their music has got this mystical kind of quality to it. A lot of North American fans started to think that, you know, these guys actually were... Um, soothsayers or um, prophets and they started to be taken really seriously. Now around about this time they decided to try and strip the music back a little bit because they were really struggling to play um, most of their album material in a live setting because it was so well orchestrated. So they tried to prune things back a little bit with this record and um, it was certainly a very successful record. There's the gatefold again. Just always just so beautifully done these albums. And um, so that, yeah, so this one, I've not been showing you the labels, have I? The beautiful Threshold label. These records, of course, were all produced by Tony Clark, who really was the George Martin to, um, you know, to the Moody's. He, he, he seemed to totally understand their music and he seemed to have a very deep um, musical empathy with them. So much so that when the various members started to break off and do solo records, um, you know, he went along with them and and and, and um, ended up producing them as well. So this one, Question of Balance, um, opens with Question by Justin Haywood, which is one of their biggest tunes, really. Melancholy Man by Pinder. It's Up to You by Justin Haywood. They're getting a bit more a bit more straightforward now. Like I said before, I think because they were trying to trying to get music together, which was easier to play in the arenas of North America. But certainly a fine album, and uh, in a sense, I think it was a bit of a peak for them. The next record, which came out uh, on um, the 23rd of July, 1971, I mean, they were incredibly prolific, you know, an album a year, just bam, bam, bam. And most of the great work they did was so early on. I mean, I used to think of the Moody's as being a 1970s band, but I mean, it was all done really by the early 70s. So um, by the time they got to this record, which is Every, Every Good Boy Deserves Favour, they were starting to go off the boil a little bit, I think. This album is easily the weakest of the ones I've shown so far. It's also one of the most common. I mean, this is the one that will still turn up in charity shops. I have two copies of this. I just see them everywhere. But um, It's a good album, but it's not a great album, I don't think. There's certainly, certainly a sense that they're starting to repeat the formula. And I think at this point... By this point in the studio, they were starting to fall out with each other a little bit. If you think of just how much work they've done in such a short amount of time, they were definitely starting to fray around the edges. But they had one more one more album in them before they broke up, and um, that one came out in 1972. So that previous one, actually, Every Good Boy Deserves Favour, that got to number one. So they were still commercially, they were still definitely um, up there. A year later, 72, uh, we've got Seventh Sojourn. This one only got to number five in the chart, so it kind of dipped a little bit. However, there was, uh, the, well, there were two huge, huge singles from this record, both of which were written by John Lodge. So it just kind of shows how he had definitely started to emerge from the shadow of Justin Haywood. Um, you have, first of all, his, his huge song, um, Isn't Life Strange, which I think, I think it won a Grammy, a, a, a really, really big song. And then the album closes with his song, I'm Just a Singer in a Rock and Roll Band, which is still probably the song that most people associate with the Moody's, maybe apart from Nights in White Satin. So by the time they got to this record, they were definitely starting to uh, hit the skids. Mike Pinder in particular, I think, had fallen out with John Lodge and he was not really happy about working with them anymore. So they did break up. Now, I've got a couple of the solo releases here. I don't have all the solo stuff. I have Blue Jays, which originally was meant to be an album. This was meant to be Justin Haywood, John Lodge and Mike Pinder, I think. Or maybe it was meant to be Justin Haywood and Mike Pinder. John Lodge got involved with it and then Mike Pinder quickly withdrew because he didn't want it to be a, a Moody's record. I think he'd essentially decided he, did, you know, he didn't want to work with anybody in the band apart from Justin Haywood. So this record 
ended up just being by John Lodge and um, Justin Haywood. It's actually a very fine album. Um, I picked this up from a charity shop a few years ago. And it's got that classic orchestral pop sound. It's produced by Tony Clark again. It wasn't a big hit. It got to number 45 on the 10th of March 1975, but it certainly kept Justin Haywood and John Lodge in, in the public's eye. So um, this one again is quite common in charity shops. You'll see that you know kicking around. If you see it, grab it. If you're a Moody's fan, it's definitely worth having. And again, it's got that wonderful mystical cover. Uh, as is this next record. This is a John Lodge solo album which came out in 1977. This has got a Roger Dean cover, Natural Avenue. I picked this up earlier this year. I've not had too many spins of this yet. Um, I have had a couple of listens to it and I think it's kind of okay. It's not it's not fantastic but it's got some okay stuff on it. So um, it's a picture of John there looking like a bit of a heartthrob. Um, so yeah, again on Decca as as all their stuff was, and um, so there was this period then between seventy two and seventy eight where they were basically splintering off and doing solo things, uh, but then they came back and um, on the 9th of June nineteen seventy eight um, they released this record Octave, which is a top ten hit, got to number six in the charts I think. This was a Mike Pindalus Moody's. He didn't want to rejoin the group, so they went on. Without him, they recruited Patrick Moraz on keyboards, and they were a bit of a different kettle of fish by this point. They sounded much more radio friendly, shorter songs, um, much more poppy. To my ears, they almost sound like they're trying to outdo Jeff Lynne at this point, who, of course, was huge with ELO uh, in the um, mid to late 70s. I mean, they'd been influenced in turn, I think, by the Moody's early stuff, but by now it sounds to me like the Moody's have really cottoned on to what Jeff Lynne's doing in the charts, having these big orchestral, pop orchestral um, hits. So they start to maybe move into that direction. So that was Octave. This is quite a recent purchase, maybe earlier this year, actually. I was looking for a copy of it. This one, I think, is a stronger record. This is um, Long Distance Voyager, which came out on the 15th of May, 1981. Got to number seven in the charts. This is a fantastic cover. You don't really notice until you look very closely that there is a spaceship um, hovering in the sky there in this very period uh, type historic scene. But this record has got the big hit single, The Voice, Talking Out of Turn by John Lodge, which is a good one as well. And um, But again, it, it definitely has that slightly more ELO-ish kind of sound. And um, I don't really know what happened with the Moody's fan base, whether people, whether they're, perhaps they're a bit like Genesis and the old fans maybe moved on and they got some new fans in the late 70s and early 80s. I'm not entirely sure. But their fortunes still still continue to be okay. This is the last album that I have by them, but there's at least four or five albums after this, and they were still doing big tours. And still clearly a big force to be reckoned with. So that's it, that's the collection. So to bring the story up to date, um, we've lost Graham Edge in more recent times. I think he died of a stroke a few years ago. So um, I, don't, I don't get the sense that the Moody's will return. I think John Lodge still does some work with one or two of the other guys, and Justin Hayward obviously has been a big solo star for years. He was on the War of the Worlds album, Jeff Wayne's musical version of War of the Worlds in the late 70s, and he's been a big solo star in his own right for a long time. But um, Anyway, so yeah, that was my little potted history of the Moody's and showing you my collection, so hope you enjoyed it, and um, I'll leave it there and just say Merry Christmas, take care, and bye for now.